network and global ATG data. This talk is in English, but you can get your headsets uh, with translation uh, near the back if you have any questions. I understand uh, Spanish. So, a tale of two synergies and covering RPKI practices for RTBH. My name is Massimo Candela. I'm a principal engineer at the Global IP Network of NTT, which is now called NTT Data. It's the same, we are the usual uh, friendly folks. Actually, we have some uh, uh, of my colleagues are here outside. They are all local, they speak Spanish and Portuguese. I'm the only gringo of the team today. Um, so, same, we just slightly changed the name. And the Global AP Network is our Tier 1 transit offering. So we are a Tier 1 transit provider. And what I do there is I work on the automation and monitoring of the network, and when time allows, I work on doing some open source and some research. This is one of those. In particular, this research was done in collaboration with these uh, fantastic uh, colleagues from various organizations. And I would like to highlight the first name, in particular, Joanna. She's the student that helped us crunching the numbers that you will see in this presentation. But what are we going to talk today? Ah, before that, also I would like to thank Manners, because this research was partially supported by Manners and their ambassador program. What are we going to talk today? Well, we are going to talk about DDoS and BGP hijacks. Actually, in reality, we're going to talk about mitigations of DDoS and BGP hijacks. Um, and how these uh, mitigation techniques, uh, they uh, work together, if they work well or not. Spoiler alert, they don't. So let's start talking about this. So what is a DDoS? Well, a DDoS is a distributed denial of service. It's essentially uh, there is a service, like, I don't know, a web server or whatever, and an attacker is going to overwhelm uh, this server with useless requests with the only goal of making this service unreachable for other users. While doing that, uh, also the network in between can be overwhelmed. And there could be collateral damage because other services may be on the network and other customers. And this is the part that we care in this presentation, which is the network, not so much of the service. And then we have BGP hijacks. Basically, an attacker wants to reroute traffic and send this traffic towards a destination where it was not originally supposed to go. Why wants to do that? Because he wants to sniff this traffic or he wants to just deny, uh, like prevent that reaches the real origin, uh, the real destination, like, a, like in case of a censorship, or it's just a typo. A typo in the prefix and now is uh, overlapping the address space of somebody else. But how, how often these uh, 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 attacks they happen? Well, DDoS, Report from 2023 from Cisco, record of 15.4 million DDoS attacks in one year. And what about instead uh, the size of it? Same year, Cloudflare report, record 200 million requests per second during a DDoS attack. And you can see in both charts that they are growing. The lines are clearly growing. Uh, Microsoft, a few months ago, new record, 3.4 terabits or something like that. So they are growing, not only in size, uh, but also in number. Uh, so, I mean, it's an interesting, it's something that we should take into consideration. And uh, BGP hijacks, it doesn't matter what platform you use to monitor. They all agree on the fact that there are thousands of these per month. Uh, and they sometimes make uh, headlines of newspapers and news because they may attack, may be attacking, um, for example, cryptocurrency wallets, financial institutions, or they are censorship that they get out of the country where they were supposed to, to stay. The good news is we have mitigations in place. So there is a mitigation for uh, DDoS, which is called uh, remotely triggered black hole, RTBH. 
and uh, for uh, hijacks the, re the resource public infrastructure, RPKI. They're both mitigation. They don't fix uh, uh, the problem completely, but they heavily help. So how does it work? So RTBH, or black calling. So imagine that you, one of your services is under attack. At some point, you don't care anymore about that service. What you want is actually for the traffic to stop entering your network. So you want to reduce the traffic and prevent the network from being overwhelmed. So what you do is you craft a BGP update. Uh, you put a specific community, which usually involves the number 666. This is bad. And uh, you propagate this update. And when this update reaches the other peers, uh, if they accept it, uh, they essentially will stop sending you the traffic. We will see with a bit more details how actually in practice this works. Uh, so they have to, however, accept it. Um, how does it work RPKI? Well, basically RPKI creates a publicly verifiable list of association between prefixes and autonomous systems. So how do you add your data? You create a raw where you associate your prefixes to your autonomous system, and raw is route origin authorization. And the other peers that they are doing the route origin validation, ROV, they can use this public list to reject or accept BGP updates by essentially verifying that the prefix and the IS, uh, they are associated in this list. So the IS is authorized to announce that and protect yourself um, and protect from accepting a potential hijack. So when I said uh, that with black calling, we don't care uh, uh, in, uh, about the service anymore. It's just to stop the traffic reaching the service and save the network. Um, in general, it's true. However, um, there are some a bit more sophisticated approaches where uh, it can be selective, like, for, for example, the selective black calling uh, uh, that entity uh, offers. But these are essentially uh, uh, agreements that you have with your peers. So for example, if you have uh, your transit provider on a web page, and this is our web page at the bottom, they may offer additional community to give you some more fine-tuned way to uh, do this black calling. So in, in the basic approach with the 666 community is like drop the traffic through this prefix. But if you have uh, 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 like some a transit that offers you something more advanced, and in this case, NTT was uh, uh, basically uh, planned this uh, uh, new approach called selective black calling. Uh, they can offer you a community like this 666. Entonces, le pueden ofrecer a esta comunidad 666, como pueden ver ahí abajo, y la comunidad ahí abajo dicen detengan el tráfico que viene de fuera del país. Así que si tienen clientes en Paraguay y pueden preguntarle al upstream que les diga, bueno, estoy bajo un ataque de dos, mis clientes son de Paraguay, detengan todo el tráfico de fuera del Paraguay. Tal vez la mayoría de los D2S estarán mitigados por esto mientras mantienen los servicios activos en Paraguay y están atacados por D2S por un tiempo, los clientes internacionales no van a poder alcanzarlos a ustedes. Es así que es un black holing selectivo. Sin embargo, el black holing no tiene nada que ver con limpiar el tráfico, es detener el tráfico. Luego hay otros servicios como DPS, Servicio de Protección de DOS, que purgan el tráfico antes de que llegue a la red. Y estos son servicios que ofrecen distintos proveedores y nosotros lo ofrecemos. Puede combinarse con RTBH, o sea, con el black holing, el black holing de fuera del país, y luego ustedes lo limpian, lo usan para limpiar el tráfico. Pero NTH es un, uh, el black holing es algo que es para detener el tráfico, no es para limpiar el tráfico. Así que, ¿dónde está el problema? Esta solución, que es bastante eficaz, exige que los peers acepten la solicitud de black holing. En la solicitud de black holing puede ser un RPKI inválido. Y si es RPK inválido, entonces los peers pueden decidir desechar esa solicitud de black holing de RTBH. Y es uno de los problemas que puede haber con estos sistemas. Así que planteemos algunas hipótesis. Primera hipótesis, la mayoría de las solicitudes de black holing son direcciones de IP únicas. Por ejemplo, barra 32, barra 128. Y generalmente no están cubiertas por ROAS. Si van a estar cubiertas por los ROAS, tal vez sean por un ROA 
que es para un prefijo menos específico, con barra 24, entonces será un RPKI inválido. Y tal vez puedan pensar, acabo de crear ROAS y voy a hacer mi solicitud de black holing. Mi solicitud de black holing va a ser una RPKI válida. Lamentablemente, RPKI es muy lento y he tenido muchas conversaciones en el pasado. Están estos dos enlaces, los de más arriba, que son donde se explica esto. Y también está esta publicación de otro grupo con el cual no estoy trabajando, pero han caracterizado este problema. Así que cuando ustedes crean el ROA, se publica el ROA y los aceptan los otros peers, lo utilizan y lo usan para la variación del origen, tal vez sea muy tarde para mitigar el ataque de DOS. Así que es muy tarde, demora mucho. Por lo tanto, dijimos que si tenemos, digamos, pocos peers, si tienen el proveedor de tránsito, entonces en el upstream les pueden decir cómo solicitar el black holing y pueden acordarlo por el entrado. Pero ¿qué pasa si están haciendo peering en un IXP donde hay más peers y más peers son los que tienen que aceptar la solicitud de black holing? Y así es como funciona en el 90% de los casos de black holing y las solicitudes. Hay unas soluciones más avanzadas y en esas otras soluciones se requiere menos cooperación entre los peers. Pero en principio es así como funciona. Tienen acá el servicio. El servicio está siendo atacado por DDoS. Generan una actualización de BGP con el prefijo, con la IP del servicio o con un prefijo que tiene este servicio. Y después tiene una comunidad como la de 666 y la actualización de PCP. Entonces, envían esto al servidor del router. La IXP tiene que decidir si acepta o no esta actualización. Tal vez si soportan el black holing, tienen algún sistema de bypass para el RPKI. En este caso, si lo tienen, entonces aceptan esta actualización, ven que hay una comunidad 666, van a agregar un next hop específico y es aquí donde ocurre efectivamente el black holing y luego sigue el caso de una IP que es filtrada por un ACL o se asocia a otra interfaz. Luego verifican que hay una comunidad no export, no advertise y entonces en ese caso lo actualizan a los demás peers y los demás peers ahora tienen que decidir si lo quieren aceptar o no. De manera que hay varios pasos intermedios. Si aceptan esto, entonces detendrán, detendrán el tráfico hacia el siguiente paso y verán menos y menos tráfico hacia el destino de ataque. Veamos entonces, comencemos entonces a caracterizar qué es lo que ocurre en la realidad. Utilicemos algunos datos. El primer conjunto de datos es el PCH, el Placket Clearing House, y estos reúnen los datos de BGP. Y el segundo conjunto de datos es el dato histórico, son los datos históricos de RPKI para hacer la validación de la ruta de origen. Pero antes de eso, tenemos que verificar todas las IXP que están en el conjunto de datos en PCH y de esos, cuáles son los que ofrecen soporte para black holing. En ese caso, tenemos que verificar cuál de las comunidades o cualquier, cuál es el next hop que hace la aceptación de estas solicitudes de black holing. Luego tenemos las pistas, las solicitudes de las solicitudes de black holing. Se filtran los datos de BGP para ver el histórico de los black holings realizados. Vimos que había 12.000 de IPv4 que hicieron black holing y respondimos a la primera pregunta. Sí, la mayoría son de direcciones únicas de IP. Más del 90% eran así. Ahora bien, ¿cuánto duran estos black holes? Generalmente una hora a dos horas en la mayoría de los casos. Algunos incluso llegan a durar un día. Tuvimos un caso que duró más de 80 horas. ¿Y cuántas veces recibe un ataque de black holing el mismo prefijo. El 50% solo una vez y el otro 50% entre 2 y 10 veces. Entonces comenzamos a caracterizar esto para ver qué era lo que estaba ocurriendo. 
Veamos entonces los datos de RPKI. Olvidemos a, de los datos de Black Hole y veamos los datos de RPKI. The RPKI data variable. We can, so when you create a raw, um, you add, of course, your prefix in the raw. So, for example, you add a raw for a slash 24. There is also another thing in the raw, which is a max length, which allows you to create a loose raw, where essentially you can say a slash 24, a max length 32, and you want to essentially use the raw to cover between your slash 24 and the slash 32. You make this raw loose by using this max length. However, this approach is strongly discouraged so much that there are conversation about removing the max length uh, completely. Because potentially, if you are not announcing all those prefixes in between, and probably you're not, uh, you may be subject still to hijack. So you can reduce the effectiveness of RPKI, what RPKI was trying to do in the first place. So we do this heat map here. And on the y axis, uh, there is the prefix length. And on the x-axis, there is the max length. So what we want to see is a lot of colors in the diagonal, which means that the max length and the prefix length in the row is the same. So everything is fine, OK, safe. And this happens for more than 80% of the cases. However, we have a, around 20%, which is composed of this uh, squares that they are above the diagonal, which means that uh, operators, they create a ROS that they are loose, that they use this max length that is actually greater than the prefix length. And if we look at the max length, which is uh, 32, uh, we see that most of the prefix length are actually 22, 23, 24. So basically, uh, some users, they create ROS for slash 22, 23, 24, and they just put max length 32 up to the end. And this is in the wider internet, like just RPKI data. But let's focus on the RPKI data from the peers that we found before they were doing black calling. And we focus only on this uh, max length equals 32. And we see that uh, also in this case, we have a good amount of uh, ROS that they are actually for slash 24. So prefix length slash 24. The greatest amount of ROS which max, with max length 32 are actually for prefixes with slash 24. So also do, uh, with uh, peers doing black calling, they actually use this loose raw approach. But let's put the data together now. Let's put black calling and RPKI together. To do that, we create three categories. The first one is RPKI strict. In RPKI strict, basically the operator does a black calling of a prefix that has a specific row for it. Then the RPKI loose category, which is the operator that actually creates this ROS and does a black calling of a prefix that is involved in this loose row with a max length that is greater than the prefix length. And the last category is RTBH agnostic, which means that the operator is under the DOS attack. It doesn't care about RPKI and is doing RPKI invalid black calling requests. As we can see, the vast majority of the operators are actually in the last category, the RTBH agnostic. So they do black calling requests that they are invalid, the vast majority of it. The second for number of peers is the RPKI loose. So with this loose raw approach and only Four for the RPKI strict. So basically, the current best practice suggested is the one less used. This makes us think as a community that probably we have to create a best practice that is more scalable than creating specific rows for each slash 32 uh, to black hole. How often does it happen that actually operators that they do black calling, they also do RPKI? Well, a lot. 91% of the operators that they were doing black calling, they also were doing RPKI. We were actually a bit surprised at this number. And we think that there is a sort of subset of kind of tech savvy operators. They know both technologies and they use it correctly. And 85 of the operators sent indeed RPKI invalid black calling requests. 
This means that it's up to the other peers to decide if they want to bypass RPKI and accept it or not. But um, what type of request they did? So were they single IP addresses like slash 32 or multiple IP addresses in the, slash, in the same slash 24? So we, we take the black calling requests, we put them synchronized in time, and we see uh, that uh, one third is single IP addresses and the other two third is uh, more than one uh, IP address in the same slash 24 black call at the same time on average two but few cases where there even were more than 100 black calls at the same time belonging to the same slash 24. So essentially the presentation is over. We knew that th there is this uh, coexistent, uh, let's say, problem between RPKI and black calling requests. This research, we wanted to put numbers on it. We wanted to characterize it and have uh, an idea of the dimension of it. Conclusion, 10% of the IXP members uh, do black calling. Um, most of their black hole prefixes are single IP addresses for a short period of time. 20%, around 20% of the operators worldwide that they deploy RPKI, they still do it with this loose ROS with the max length greater than the prefix length, and they remain potentially vulnerable to hijacks. 91% of the uh, operators that they trigger black hole, they also do RPKI, so RPKI and black calling, uh, it's uh, quite common that they uh, 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 go together. And 85% of the operators sent RPKI invalid black calling requests. This means that they really trust the IXP to do an exception to their RPKI validation for uh, black calling requests, which may happen, but they also trust the other peers to do the same and to accept. Uh, uh, these requests. So my presentation is over, and before the questions, we are, uh, after lunch we are going to, there is this uh, beautiful miniature of uh, the McLaren uh, entity IndyCar. Uh, we are going to raffle it. If you put your business card, uh, you may be selected. And these are my colleagues. They are here outside at the entity data booth. And uh, well, that's all, and uh, thank you very much. And I don't know if there is uh, time for some questions, but uh, thank you for your attention. We have time for a couple of questions. Uh, you mentioned it about the, the black holing solutions on IXPs. Uh, it, uh, I just want to comment that is we need to defer uh, the sinkhole from black hole, and uh, this is this is a big part of the issue. Uh, IXS should implement uh, data plane based filtering on black hole, doing with flow spec or KB QoS propagation based, but they should do. But this is another speech. And uh, you mentioned it about the RPKI loose. Mm -hmm. uh, it, just to, to confirm that uh, it is uh, a way, uh, well, when you have an invalid prefix, it can be invalid by date on the, uh, date on the cer certificate, invalid by origin ISN, and invalid by longer IS, longer prefix match. Yeah? So uh, th that the point is that it is, it is still invalid, but only invalid considering, considering the longer prefix. Yeah? So, yeah, uh, to an, okay, to answer both questions. The first one, yes, I agree. That's why I said that 90% uh, they use the basic one, and there are a few that they do more data plane oriented uh, uh, IXPs, uh, data plane oriented uh, black calling at IXPs, but most of them at the moment they are doing the, the basic one, which anyway requires cooperation. To answer the, the uh, RPKI related, so for black calling, having a rod that is loose is not really a problem. The problem is actually that the ROA is kind of reducing the RPKI efficacy on the hijack. So basically, you are in a way facilitating your black calling, but uh, making, exposing yourself to hijack. Uh, if uh, they don't use this loose, but they use the, uh, they just ignore the, 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 the specific slash 32 of the prefix, they, they are going to black hole. Most of the time, 
and this was the case that we verified, they had ROAS for a less specific prefix, as you said, and basically that is going to create RPKI invalid because of that, because essentially the prefix that they are announcing is outside of the validity range of the ROA, of, of the less specific ROA. Thank you, it, it answers, thank you. Uh, my name is Junior, uh, I'm from Brazil, and I do not have a question, but I have a provocation to you. Uh, why you guys and your colleagues from Taiwan providers are putting forces in black holes? This don't solve any problem. It, this, this don't solve the, 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 the attack. Why you guys uh, don't uh, 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 put your, uh, our forces, your forces in the flow spec, for example? Because, okay, you are, you are solving the problem with the black hole and the air PKI, but okay, we need flow spec because uh, black hole does not solve the problem, just uh, <laughs> increase the problem. So why you guys are putting forces in, in, in this whole thing? Okay, no, I, I agree with that. And actually, I, I mentioned it in the slides that it, black holing does not really resolve the black, that, that DDoS. Actually, the DDoS goal is to make a destination unreachable, and by doing a black holing, you are just doing that. And I agree with you. Um, black holing is, anyway, a way to, it's a cheap way extremely cheap way that is offered to customers that if they want to do it to actually stop traffic towards a destination. And it's not the only solution. So as I said, uh, I think now many tier one, they offer other solutions which are about cleaning the traffic and we also uh, do that. But they still offer solutions like black calling. And in particular, if you associate them with uh, more advanced like selective black calling, they could be good enough, fast enough, and absolutely free to actually uh, mitigate it. It doesn't solve it, it mitigates. That's why I used mitigation and I said, it doesn't fix it, it's just mitigate. So in those cases, it is quite effective, especially if you want something that is just works and it's free, uh, you can do that. Okay. that. That is mostly. It, Yes, there are also solutions more advanced to just clean the traffic, but there are other type of solution with other costs. Okay, any other question? Well, uh, I say well, Massimo. Thank you very much. Well, we want to thank Massimo.